Nobody beat me. <laughs> I do lose sometimes, though. Everybody does. But when I do, I hold it. I take it with me everywhere I go. I damn near love it. When it comes to the streets, there is a delicate balance between fear and respect. Imagine where both fear and respect are two sides of the same coin. To survive in the street and drug game, you need both. But respect isn't just earned through brute force, although some do use fear and force to gain that respect. It's also earned through loyalty and actions. So they do go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Although I think we can take this one step further. I believe reputation is equally as important. Whether it's someone making moves behind your back, cutting you out of deals, to challenging your authority, your reputation needs to be protected at all costs. Now underneath there's also another element, revenge. Sometimes it's not about money, paper or territory. In the streets, settling scores isn't just personal, it's a driving force to assert that fear and respect and keeping your reputation intact for those who dare challenge it. So in this video, the underlying theme will be fear, respect, reputation and revenge. And as always, we're going to be running through a lot of parallels to power, easter eggs, clues and theories, which will be more than the usual. So make sure you stick with this video till the end, as we dissect all things Raising Canaan, Season 3, Episode 8. Now, this episode starts with the older Canaan's narration conveying the message of self-doubt and negative self-perception, especially when the person is alone with their own thoughts, just like Rock. During this period, this is where your mind starts talking to you. Although the older Kane's narration did acknowledge some people may actually have positive thoughts, but not him, not Rock, and at this moment in time, definitely not Uncle Lou. But the most intimidating and critical voice that we can sometimes hear is our very own, because self-criticism is the harshest and scariest. Now, as Rock was in her own thoughts, Lou was heard shouting his out aloud, thoughts which you probably don't want to be sharing with the world. He started pouring for all the fallen soldiers that he's had to take care of or fallen because of their mistakes and actions. Now Rock grabbed him and brought him inside because the last thing she needed was her neighbours or anybody else hearing Lou in this drunken state, especially with the task force breathing down their neck. She calls Marvin because Lou's a mess and a liability, although Marvin's answer is he needs a programme, someone to talk to just like he did back in season 2, because if he can turn his life around, so can Lou, which is where I have to kind of agree and disagree. No doubt Marvin is a changed man, but Lou's problem is he won't stop talking about shit he shouldn't be talking about, and putting him in that environment may not be the best idea, but it is clear, Marvin doesn't want to give up on his baby brother, because you never give up on family. Yo, we'll never give up on family. Now, Rock soon turns the conversation over to business and tells Marvin, Kanan is fucking with Ronnie, Snaps and Pop. However, notice when Marvin questioned where she got the information from, she said it didn't matter, and that's because she had it from Duke. I previously mentioned in one of my breakdowns, Rock is one of the biggest hypocrites the Power Universe has ever seen. In season 1, she shut Marvin out because he kept making mistakes, with one of them being how he pulled Kanan in the game and put him in danger, but now the shoe is on the other foot, and I think if Marvin were to ever find out Rock was getting information from Duke, I really don't think he'd be too happy. In terms of business, Marvin said that he's known that Kanan's been moving Reefer for a while, and it's nothing to worry about, however, Rock was right, it was more than just Reefer because Snaps and Pop wouldn't get involved in small business ventures. Now on Lou, Rock says maybe it is her fault that Lou turned out the way he has. Chickens come home to roost, which is something I've said a lot when it comes to Rock. Chickens will come home to roost when all the secrets are revealed. Although in the short term, I do agree with their stance. She does what she has to do to survive. She takes the heat when she needs to, and she makes tough decisions and moves on. Whether those decisions are right or wrong, it is all a part of the game. Lou may not like who he's seeing right now in his self-reflection, but when she looks in the mirror, she knows who she is. With Marvin, he said he's actually liking his self-reflection because he has changed in recent times. Now this is a very common theme that we have seen across the Power Universe, where characters look in the mirror. It's one place where you can't hide from who you are, the choices that you've made or about to make, and the person that you've become or the person that you're becoming. Some may believe that they're legit businessmen, but the truth is always a bit more complex. The truth is always a lie. So just hold on to that thought, because I will be coming back around to a very interesting theory specifically for Marvin's character later on in this breakdown. Now with Kanan and Ronnie, they were in a meeting with Snaps and Pop, where he rejected the offer of a drink, which is something I do think we should keep in mind. Watching how alcohol is having such a negative effect on Lou's life, he's probably thinking he's better off staying clear, with a clear mind, focused on building his empire. We also know he's not going to be turning into no Franklin Sane, although he did drink lean in OG power. This is also where Snaps liken him to Defcon, because Defcon didn't drink, do drugs, or fuck with girls, with Rock being the only one Pop knew about. According to Snaps, Defcon was always said to have a clear mind and a level head. 
he was always formidable and according to Ronnie, feared. And for Ronnie to say Defcon was feared, that is something coming from someone like Ronnie. Respected was another, which is where Snaps asked Kanan the question, would you rather be feared or respected? Now here's where Kanan gave a very similar to answer how Tariq would answer a question in his canonical studies class. He said it was a trick question. If you fear someone, you respect them, they're the same. Fear is respect, respect is fear. So Kanan sees both fear and respect as the same. One can't exist without the other. And at some point, his name will be feared and respected on the streets, just like we learned Ghost's name was in OG Power. And your reputation, te presido. La calle, te teme, la calle te tiene miedo. Now, after this meeting was over and done with, something I do think we need to talk about is Pop questioning whether Ronnie's ever had a real girlfriend. And Ronnie's response was, yeah, but not if he ever remembers their name. And I know a lot of people do think Ronnie could be into guys, even after seeing him with Juliana. So it is just something to keep in mind. Snaps and Pop know their shit on the streets. People come and tell them a lot of things because of who they are and what they've done. And I don't think it is a coincidence that the writers are making this point known. So again, it is just something to keep in mind. Now here's where Snaps also warned Kanan his mother is competition and how she's good at this work. But Kanan's response was, so was he, which I think Snaps liked the sound of. Now to round off on the night, we had Aisha and Jukebox getting a little close. Earlier in the season, they left a little clue that Aisha was kind of into Duke because she did question whether she was still with Nicole. And for Duke to open up to Aisha about what happened in the past, although not the full truth around how she died, it really is a big step for someone like Duke, who hasn't openly spoken about this before. Opening up to Aisha also mirrors what her father Marvin's been doing in recent times, but it also means she trusts and cares about her, and I do think we are going to see this relationship blossom and turn into a bit of a romantic one. Now, the following morning, we see Joyce coming over to Rock's house to look after Lou, because Rock had to get to work, although Joyce wasn't here out of the goodness of her heart. With Marvin, we saw him doing what Rock asked, keeping tabs on Kanan and finding out what he was getting into. He was watching him and Ronnie from afar, while he gave his couriers his work. He then follows one as he goes to make a delivery, and takes him off his bike where he finds out they're the ones moving H in Queens. Now, while Marvin was digging into their competition, Rock was trying to resolve the issue around transportation. She came over to meet Terry who runs this distribution company. Terry wanted the same deal Rock gave Hung, but Rock isn't someone who can be held for ransom. No matter what situation she finds herself in, she will never show any signs of weakness and show that she's desperate. She'll always project this powerful image, so her offer was her offer. Now elsewhere I do think Terry's brother David may become a problem later on down the line. Terry mentioned that he's a drug addict, and Rock's got enough liabilities to deal with when it comes to Lou. So speaking of Lou, back at Rock's house when Lou woke up, Joyce was kind enough to make her son some breakfast, although she did do as good of a job as Yasmin did in Power Book 2 Ghost when she burnt the bacon. Although mind you, Yasmin is just a little girl. But Lou already had enough, it was way too early for his mother's bullshit, so he was out, even though Rock gave her specific instructions to keep Lou inside. He went back to the studio but was also back on the drink. Now Shelley did try and tell him that nothing is as bad as it seems, but for Lou, it was as bad as it could get because of what he's done and what he's been through. Now, with Lou out in the wind at this moment in time, Famous was left in a bit of a limbo because Shirley said that he could be away for a while. But while he was away, she did give him permission to use the studio at the back of Café Vu, although he would have to help around at the club to pay for his studio time. Now, this can actually keep Famous busy and away from the streets, which is exactly what he needs in his position. He's got the studio at the back where he can do what he loves, while a job working with Shirley at Café Vu can keep him away from trouble on the streets. However, we all know it's never going to be that simple, especially for someone like Famous, and he will no doubt find himself at a crossroads soon. So let's see how they turn his story upside down and whether Luke could do the unthinkable. Later he found himself out in the sticks where he shouldn't be. He came face to face with two guys that tried to rob him for his wallet and watch, but you can tell where he is at this moment in time with his life. He's ready to go. He told them if they're gonna do it, then just do it, which even took them by surprise. So as of now, he has given up, just like it was said E-Train did in the past. Now, as Rock met with Quan, he wasn't impressed. One of his guys bought this from Queens, which was delivered by a courier. Rock had competition who was already up and running in her territory. And at this moment in time, she wasn't even aware that it was Kanan and Ronnie. Quan said whoever was dealing in Queens had to be dealt with as well as warning Rock that he's still yet to see her deliver on a promise. He gave her a few months to get her operation up and running, but she's still buying the same amount of product, which is because she hasn't been able to put the pieces in place around her transportation. 
Now, this was Shelly on the phone to Marvin telling him that Lou came around, but he's gone, and it didn't seem like he was in a good place. But Rock gets straight to business, which is where she found out this was Kanan. Kanan and Ronnie were her competition, although they weren't her only problem. Lou left the house, went to the club, and is now nowhere to be seen. Now, this is where Marvin and Rock had a bit of a disagreement on what their next move should be. Rock wanted them to focus on how to get their operation up and running, because Quan was putting pressure on her to deliver on her promise. So she wanted Marvin to solve the transportation issue. However, Marvin said tracking down Lou should be the priority, because as we've mentioned before, he is the definition of family first. No matter how wild Lou was being, and how much of a liability he is, Lou needed them, which Marvin understood more than Rock, because he's been where Lou is at this moment in time, but Rock hasn't. As always, she's thinking about business and making that money, but at what cost? Look around her, she's alone in this big house which doesn't feel like much of a home. She's barely got a relationship with her mother, Lou hates her, and so does Kanan. And I'm just waiting for the day it is revealed that Rock might have been behind Marvin going to prison, because that really would be the moment where she loses Marvin as well, which is only a theory I've been through, but definitely plausible considering Rock's history, what she's done in the past, and what we've seen her do on screen. Now with Jukebox, Aisha and Crystal, they're ready to give the performance of their life. Everything seems like it's falling into place for their first official gig, with Juke rightfully earning the place as lead role, which of course, didn't go down well with Crystal. She was rightfully put in a place by Ankia, however, she was never going to play second fiddle to Juke. She was going to do whatever it took to take that lead role, which is something we're going to get to in just a moment. But first, she was here rubbing it in Aisha and Juke's face. Her and Kanan were now a thing, and Juke was ready to go for them if it wasn't for Aisha. She said why does she need them when she's got her, which goes back to these two getting closer as each episode passes by. Now later with Juke, while she was catching her train, she was jumped by two girls who made it known. They were here to stop her from getting to her rehearsals, although Juke isn't someone who can be fucked with, two on one or not, we all knew Juke would be able to hold it down, and had it not been for them pulling out a knife, Juke would have been good, but she had no choice but to back down, although she did make it to her rehearsals, but battered and bruised, which isn't a good look, but she did make it known to Crystal, her friends ain't shit, and neither is she, so if she wanted to take this lead role from Juke, she was gonna have to try harder. Now just continuing with Juke's story in 308, she came over to Sergeant Healy's office and asked him, why she wanted to back out from joining the military, but he said she signed a contract and that means she made a commitment and they take commitments very seriously, so it is going to be hard to undo this, so just like the street and drug game, getting out is a lot harder than getting in. With law enforcement, Detective Howard is a character who I said firmly remains on my investigation board and this is why. After the dust settled around his daughter's death, Captain Beck has a lot of regret and guilt, so he now wants to get to the bottom of what she meant by Howard having secrets and why she was so fixated on investigating her partner. Now both he and Mr Bingham have a lot in common, they're both fathers who find themselves on their own, with both trying to make sense of losing their daughters. So they sat and spoke about Nicole and Shannon, with Captain Beck echoing what Jukebox told Mr Bingham in Season 2, Episode 10. Captain Burt didn't do anything in Nicole and me. Jukebox couldn't live with the guilt of someone else being blamed for Nicole's death, so she told Mr Bingham Detective Burke had nothing to do with what happened to Nicole. However, bringing it back to 308, Mr Bingham said when a detective came over, he said maybe Shannon may be complicit after all, and even though he didn't name drop Howard, Captain Beck definitely knew. This is why I still feel there may be a twist to the tale. Marvin may be the centre of Agent Tanner's investigation, but Captain Beck is still very well respected by law enforcement for all his years of work with the NYPD. So let's see what he does with this information, and whether this brings Adina Foyle back into the picture. Now speaking of Detective Howard, we pick up with him meeting Ogden over at Queen's Narcotics. This is where we hear Ogden telling him Marvin Thomas is checking all their boxes. They have him linked to the Baselli crew, the tenants at Baisley and the 40s could also place him at both locations. He also told him that if he had anything on Marvin to help bring this home, even better. However, this goes back to my investigation where we broke down how both Marvin and Detective Howard could find themselves in orange jumpsuits. It does seem like Marvin is the main target but Captain Burke may have other ideas, so Detective Howard may want to watch his back. Now, just to finish this chapter with law enforcement in 308, we caught up with Gerald, his daughters, and Marvin at a cafe. He was writing an article about Jukebox, but the questions he was asking about bulletproof records and the connections to the Italian Mafia had nothing to do with Juke or an entertainment section, and the minute he mentioned he spoke to a friend at the NYPD about Marvin, you could tell. Marvin picked up a knife and he was holding back, 
If it weren't for Gerald's two daughters sitting next to him, who knows what he would have done, because he clearly was crossing the lines. Now this is where I do want to circle back to the conversation with Rock and Marvin, and the theory I spoke about earlier. Marvin mentioned he's liking who he's seeing in the mirror, but I really do feel he's going to face his biggest test yet, because Gerald Moore is undercover, he's being pressured by Agent Tanner, so it's only a matter of time when Marvin finds out. So just like I mentioned before, Marvin's going to be tested like he's never been tested before, and he does know more than anyone, snitches have to go. We know what happened when he gave Sam a chance at the end of season 2, so is Marvin willing to take that risk again? But is he willing to leave these two girls without their father? This is why he's going to have to take a long hard look in the mirror about who he is and who he wants to be. Now in regards to the issue with transportation, Marvin did do what needed to be done. This woman was planted by Marvin which gave them something to blackmail Terry with, so I guess this was their transportation issue sorted, otherwise these pictures would find their way to Terry's wife. Meanwhile we're rock. We know who she is. She isn't afraid to get her hands dirty or play dirty to her neither. She sent Laura Ward from child services to try and assert some control over Kanan. While he was with Crystal, he was warned he's got 24 hours to return home, or the next time she sees him, she'll be with the police, and he'll end up in handcuffs. So this was Rock, I guess, doing what Rock does. Although Kanan did manage to resolve this problem thanks to the help of Ronnie doing what he does, being feared. Now we don't exactly know what Ronnie did say to Laura, but it probably went along the lines of this. Kanan says you talk a lot. So just like Paul, Laura probably won't be an issue going forward. Now Rock didn't just stop at sending child services, her next move was to visit Snaps and Pop to warn them, stop fucking with Kanan. But just before we get there, just like with Ronnie in 304, there was a lot of history in this room. Pop said that she remembered Rock when she had pigtails, jumping rope in front of her parents, but Rock has come a long way since then, and as always, she gets straight down to business and tells them, stay away from her son. We learn that Snaps and Pop never had kids of their own, but they do understand that her relationship with Kanan at this moment in time is delicate to say the least. They also tell Rock that their business isn't with Kanan, he's just an associate of an associate, although it is safe to say, Rock didn't see it that way. Now this is where we begin to find out just how powerful Snaps and Pop really are. They know Rock's connect is Stefano because of Pop's history and he's only in business with Rock until they tell him to sit the fuck down. So even though they were sat at the same table, Snaps made it pretty clear they ain't in the same league. Rock still needed to be in this business to get paid, whereas Snaps and Pop, they've been there and done that. They've been paid and continue to get paid. But they still have a lot of power, pull, influence and respect in the streets, even though they are retired. They made it clear what they did back in the day which was spilled through blood, sweat and tears. That's why Rock can do what she can, because in Snaps' words, they were the ones who made the game. Now Rock is someone who doesn't bow down to anyone, no matter how powerful they are and how many men they have standing behind them. Rock kneels for no man, and the same goes in this situation. She said everybody claims to have been the first through the door, but the ones who really matter are the last ones to leave. Now as she did leave, Pop questioned whether this shit with Ronnie was worth all this bullshit with Rock. She could tell that this wasn't the same girl she knew in pigtails, jumping rope, but Snaps wasn't backing down. He didn't appreciate the fact Rock came into their place of business telling them what they can and can't do. So just like Kanan said at the beginning, fear and respect go together, but if you don't have those two, then where does it leave your reputation? Reputation is a huge thing in the streets. Whether you're retired or not, you have to guard it with your life, especially when there's someone hunting your spot. So it is game on between Snaps and Rock. Now child services and telling Snaps to back off from Kanan wasn't enough for Rock. She came over to Panessa's because she wanted to know where they were getting their work. Panessa was scared because she didn't want to end up like Unique and also because she's all Jerome has. It was mother to mother both trying to protect their sons, but in very contrasting ways. However, Panessa did let it slip that she did see Ronnie at home with a woman from the bodega, and that rang alarm bells for Rock because maybe just like Pop, she's maybe never had or ever known Ronnie to fuck with any girls. So Rock got what she wanted, but at what cost? Just like Marvin's story with Gerald and his daughters, will Panessa pay the price and leave Jerome all on his own? Now after Rock got this information from Panessa, she went straight over to Joaquin to let him know that his cousin sister was making moves behind his back. She was cutting him out of deals, just like she did to her in season 2 with Tremont. But he wanted to double check the information, and if it did turn out to be true, then Rock would have Joaquin's blessing to do what she's wanted to do for a very long time. Although Rock was going to pull the trigger either way, but before she did, she did remind Juliana of who she was before they met. She was a scared woman at the bodega who needed Rock's help to get rid of her husband. 
Now, this wasn't about money, dollars, and cents. For Rock, it was way bigger. Revenge isn't about business. Revenge doesn't get you paid. Sometimes it's about fear, respect, and reputation. So just like she told Kanan in season 1, she took Juliana out with two to the chest and one to the head. And now the war between Ronnie and Rock has well and truly begun.